called CleverSafe, and we'll talk about this. A huge growth is in unstructured data. What do I mean by unstructured data? Data that is not in the database. This is videos and audio files. These are PowerPoints and spreadsheets. These are documents. Uh, a variety of different types of information are unstructured. And these are growing much faster than the growth in databases. We're seeing a lot uh, bigger growth pattern with unstructured data. Internet of Things, capturing with smart meters, uh, call records on the mobile phones, um, all of this activity. So why is object storage so exciting? I tell people that the problem with block and file is very location based. When you put something in block 52, you have to remember it's in block 52 so you can get it back. And this is an issue. If I, for example, uh, last year we had a conference in Las Vegas and I parked my car in the seventh floor of the parking garage and went down to the hotel and ate dinner with the uh, clients in the restaurant. And then we went uh, kind of uh, smoke cigars in the patio and maybe have some whiskey. I forgot where I put my car. <laughs> totally forgot. What level? Where, where, where did I put it? And this is always the problem with parking, because it's location based. It has to be exactly back to where I was before. If instead I went to the valet parking and say, here's my car, please park it for me. I don't care where it's parked. They give me a stub, and when I come back, here's my stub, come bring me back my car. So. This is a lot simpler for the storage administrator and a lot simpler for the developer who's developing software. Now, it's not necessarily good for things like databases or virtual machines. So in another example, I was going to park my car at an Italian restaurant where all the parking was full, so they had free valet parking, and they drove my car three blocks away to a parking garage for free. And I go inside the restaurant, and I realize that my coat was too much. It was warm inside the restaurant. It was hot. So I go back, I, please put my coat in the back seat of my car. And they said, no, we have to bring your car back. You put the coat in, get back in line, and then we'll park your car again all over. And that's what happens with object storage. You get the whole object, you change it, you store the whole object back. Does that make sense for a database? No. Virtual machine? No. That's too much activity. So those things don't apply to object storage. But what does apply are things that are static and stable. Things that you write once and maybe you're only going to change a few times. Photographs, images, videos, medical images like x-ray machine images. Seismic information if you are doing seismic readings for oil and gas. So IBM had already two solutions. We had Spectrum Scale, which we talked about earlier, the world's fastest file system, used by over 200 of the top 500 supercomputers in the world. We also had the least expensive storage on tape. And Spectrum Archive allows us to store files on tape. And when we told people, you know, they have these two choices. They said, well, we would like something that's not so fast and not so expensive. And we said, no problem. Have 10% of Spectrum Scale with 90% of Spectrum Archive. But that's like telling people to put your head in the freezer and your foot in the oven and control until everything is room temperature. It didn't make sense. So we acquired CleverSafe in the middle as not so fast, not so cheap, somewhere in the middle, moderate price storage, moderate performance. So we acquired CleverSafe. It's been around since 2004. Uh, it is ranked number one three years in a row now uh, with IDC as being the best object storage. And uh, over 400 patents, incredible uh, inventions and, and innovations here. Now, we renamed their product IBM Cloud Object Storage System, which is a boring name. IBM is good with boring names. If, if IBM bought Coca-Cola Company, we'd rename the, the, the drink 
brown carbonated sugar liquid, right? Uh, this is just the way it is. Uh, but that's the name now, Cloud Object Storage System. Now, the nice thing about Cloud Object Storage System is like Spectrum Scale, it also supports erasure coding. So if we want to protect against one drive failure, we could do RAID 5 or create two copies of the data with RAID 10. Two drive failure, we can use RAID 6 or make three copies of the data. So you can see here, more efficient to do RAID 6. 4 plus 2 parity is 1.5 times. Triple the data takes up three times. So to be more efficient, RAID 6. Here I have 7 plus 5. That's only 1.7, and I can lose five drives. In fact, I can use any combination of K pieces with M parity and come out with N slices. And so mathematically, I can now make a very robust solution that can tolerate a lot of drive failures. Now, somebody asked me, how exactly does that happen? They can understand one parity, but they don't understand five parities. It's really not five parities. We take, and here I have five plus three. I take my five variables and run it through eight mathematical equations, and I can take any five equations and solve for the five variables. So it's all done with math. It's that simple. So if I only have five answers, S1 to S8, and I only have five of them, that's all I need. So I can lose any three, and I can calculate the data. So I have a petabyte of unstructured, static and stable data. What do I do to store it? One option, the traditional approach, treat it like a database. Let's pretend it gets changed every hour. So I'm going to have RAID protection, and I'm going to mirror it to another box on the same data center, and then I'm going to replicate it to a third location far away, and I'm going to take backups every day. And I'm going to put it on infrastructure that was designed for online transaction processing with a lot of cache memory designed for taking lots of activity. And then I'm going to have many full-time employees handling all of those different parts of the solution. Now, that's treating it like a database. But we know this is not a database data. This is static and stable data that changes very rarely. So instead, we can say 1.7x from erasure coding is good enough. No tape copies, no mirroring, just everything 1.7x. I use 60% less hardware because I'm just going to use cheap servers with cheap drives. And one full-time employee can easily handle many petabytes of data. 70% lower total cost of ownership using this new approach taking advantage of the fact that it only works with static and stable data. Compared to NetApp, we did a side-by-side -side comparison, and we even did Metro Cluster to, to have a comparable protection of, of data, 80% less. Against Microsoft Azure, against Amazon Web Services, we are typically 10 to 30% less expensive. So depending on where you were going to store this information, we can save you money. So here are the components of the architecture. Your application server or your end user uses regular HTTP over Ethernet to access the data. We call them accessors. These can be virtual machines or physical machines. And these are your valet parking attendants. You give the data to the valet parking attendant they park it for you. They park it in storage pools, which we call slice store servers. So a storage pool would be a level of your parking garage. And if you need more space, you add another parking garage. All right? And then you can set up vaults that are specific to departments or specific users or people of a specific business function. And only certain people can read and write objects into those vaults. Our cause manager basically allows us to see the capacity and performance and gathers all the statistics so you can monitor and manage your entire environment. 
very straightforward, three parts. Accessor, slice store, cause manager. All right, so basically I'm going to take the data, chop it up into pieces, and store it. If I do 7 plus 5, I'm going to chop it up into 7 pieces, go through 12 equations, and store the results of those 12 equations on 12 different drives on 12 different servers. I only need seven to get the data back, and I reconstitute the data back to the original. All right, how does that happen? The accessor is just software. It could be software running on a physical x86 server. It could be uh, VMware, it could be Docker. Takes the data, runs it through the equation, so it only needs CPU and memory to do the calculations. Nothing incredibly complicated there. And then it sends all 12 pieces at the same time in parallel to 12 servers. And here, um, I can choose to have them at the same site or different sites. We'll talk about uh, different site configurations. Now, some people said, well, if I send them all at the same time, what if they don't all say I'm safely written? That's valid, right? Maybe one of them says, uh, please wait. And another one said, I failed. I tried to write and it failed. Or another one, I got no response back, nothing. I wrote it and I didn't hear anything that it's written safely. Well, you can decide how many you're willing to accept. I only need seven to get the data back. So if I wrote nine, is that good enough? Sure, why not? You can say, for if I've got nine, that's good enough. You can write 10, 11, and 12 later at nighttime. Okay? So we are constantly going through and saying, is anything less than 12? Yes, this one only has 11. Let's make the 12th one. We can always read seven, calculate it, and put it back in again. You get to decide this number. So you can say 7, 9, 12, or 7, 10, 12, or 7, 11, 12. You decide how many you have to have written to feel comfortable about the write is successful. Now, if you're writing a billion objects, you probably don't want to be managing a billion with encryption. No problem. We can do the encryption for you. What we do is we generate the key, unique for every object, and then we encrypt the data, and then use the data itself as a hash code to obfuscate the key. And then we put the two together and chop it up seven pieces. So each piece has one-seventh of the key. One-seventh of the key. Can you do anything with one-seventh of a key? No. All right? It's not until you put all the pieces back that you can make the key again that you can then decrypt the data. So we call this the all or nothing package, AONT. And the beauty of this approach is you get full encryption support without having to manage all the keys individually. We manage them for you. They're stored in the data, scattered in little pieces. So when I need the data back, I can get the data back. Now let's say that I stored in San Francisco in San Juan and in New York City. And San Francisco, they had an earthquake and they're now part of the Pacific Ocean. But that's okay because I only need seven back. So I can get four from here and three from New York and I have the pieces I need. So the beauty of this solution is that even if I lose a site, I can still get all my data back. And I didn't have to make three copies. I'm still only 1.7x of what I had. All right? So we can do this in a single site. And even for single site, this works very well because it's better than RAID 6. It can tolerate many drive failures. I can choose, if I want, complete duplication across two locations. If you have to have two separate copies, 1.7x, 1.7x, we can do that. And so when you create an object here, it gets copied here. When you create an object here, it goes here, completely bi-directional. 
if you lose the connection in between, they both keep writing. And then later we'll connect back. And, but the most popular one is having geographically dispersed. If you have three or more, then you can lose any site and you have 100% access of your data. No disaster recovery, no failover, no restore, 100% of your data instantly. Now, if you don't have three buildings, no problem. You can have cloud be one of your buildings. In fact, you can have cloud be all three of your buildings. You can mix on-premise and cloud to come up with how many sites you want. Have you ever tried to grow your environment, add more capacity, add more uh, space to a file system or to a block device? Well, you'd like to rearrange and move things, but it's location-based. And if you move things, you break all your applications. Not true here, OK? So I have maybe one accessor and 12 slice stores. If I want more performance, I just get more accessors, more parking lot attendants. Now, these could be temporary. I can have these all be virtual machines temporarily during peak season and take them back down again when I don't need them so much. If I need more capacity, I just add more drives to the servers, or I get more servers. And each pool doesn't have to be the same exact one as the previous. I could have two terabyte drives here, and six terabyte drives here, and four terabyte drives here. So long as the 12 drives match, they don't have to match anything else. So you don't have to worry about, oh, how am I going to find two terabyte drives 10 years from now when nobody makes two terabyte drives anymore? All right, but look how simple it is. I can add more storage without telling anybody because if you have a claim stub, you get your data back. The fact that we moved things around and balanced it doesn't matter because you as an application owner doesn't have to know. All right, so just like when you park your car with the valet parking, they might put it on the third level and then move it to the seventh level and then move it down to the second level because they had to. Doesn't matter to you. You get it, you get it. So we offer this three ways. You can get it as software, and then you can install it on your own x86 server. So that's one option. Hey, I want to buy my servers from Hewlett Packard, or from Seagate, or from Cisco. Or you can have pre-built systems already put together for you or you can get it as a cloud service. So all three are available to you and you can mix and match. So let's take a look here. We have adopted a standard within IBM that when we say local, we mean private cloud on-premise, and when we say dedicated, we mean private cloud off-premise in a cloud service provider, such as IBM in the cloud service. And so if you wanted everything local, on-premise, doesn't leave your building, you can do that. And we recommend 500 terabytes or more. If you are less than 500 terabytes, then maybe a V7000 or V5000 might be better fit for you, price-wise. But usually I recommend 500 terabytes. I've seen people with 200 terabytes, 300 terabytes, perfectly happy with cloud object storage because they're going to grow and they know they're going to grow. So uh, you can do that by software and put it on your own servers or by pre-built systems. If you choose dedicated, you can run in the IBM cloud, but it's dedicated to you. Nobody's going to share your equipment. Bare metal servers that only you are running on. And you can choose to let IBM manage it for you or you can choose to let your own staff manage them remotely, where they connect to uh, remotely and have it, or some hybrid configuration. Now, both of those, you're paying for the physical machines. So even if you only write one object to 12 servers, too bad. You're paying for those 12 machines. So if you want to just pay for what you use, we also have public cloud support. 
and you only pay for the number of terabytes you actually write. So if you wrote 12 terabytes, you pay for 12 terabytes. And a lot of people are doing that to practice and get used to it before they decide they're going to buy actual equipment with actual servers. So here's an example. Two petabytes usable. It's actually 3.4 petabytes. But because of the 1.7 factor, only two petabytes of actual. I have six accessors. I have 12 slice stores. I have one cause manager. Two petabytes for less than a million dollars. This is list prices. You probably can get better. 445,000 for the hardware, 450,000 for the software, and 135,000 annual maintenance for support. These are extremely attractive prices. If you have petabytes of data and you're shopping around for where am I going to store this, you're not going to find anything better. Who is using? Is that for the cloud? This, this would be for an on-premise cloud, on-premise cloud. And we have similar numbers for off-premise if you want to see them. Good question. I have no idea what those mean. <laughs> so, <laughs> good. I have. I am not even going to guess an answer there. Sunny notes are locked. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to. We'll have to get back to you on that because. Uh, Well, I know a lot of customers in the healthcare and pharma who use yeah. object storage, so we can find out. Yeah, we'll look into that. Yeah, right. All right. Good. You stumped the speakers already. All right, here are the types of industries, and this is from uh, most to least. Our number one industry that is using object storage is financial services. And then you have telco and service providers because telephone companies and service providers are now offering to store data for you as a service that they can then make that available uh, to their account holders. Media and entertainment, being able to distribute videos, all browsers can do object storage today. When you go on CNN or USA Today or any, all of those photos are stored as objects. Public sector and government, huge benefit there. There's a lot of scanned images. There's a lot of uh, forms to fill out for the taxes or whatever. Great place to store all of these things. Static and stable. Healthcare life sciences. When you take an x-ray, are you going to change it? No. It's an x-ray. What you might change is the HL7 or the DICOM headers describing the information, the metadata, but that's the only thing you change. And then industrial and distribution, manufacturing, blueprints, things, construction, where you can have uh, multiple locations accessing all the data. Now you might be thinking, I don't get and put objects. My applications read and write files. They all read and write files. So do I have to brand new write the applications from scratch? Not at all. We have partnered with a lot of different products, a lot of different companies to make it easier to deploy. So for example, we have NAS gateways that convert NFS, SIFS, SMB into object storage. So now your applications read and write files and I'm behind it's all object storage. So 
So we've certified Spectrum Scale can do that. Panzura, Nasuni, Avir are just examples that we have certified to work together. All the major backup software can read and write directly to object storage. Commvault, Net Backup, IBM Spectrum Protect. You don't have to do anything. It's already built in. We have support for SharePoint, for IRODs, for Hadoop, SME, uh, Aspera for file transfers. Already built in support for object storage. And more are coming. Everybody wants to get into this situation. All right, here's a great example. Shutterfly is one of my, my bigger clients, 150 petabytes managed by three people. Three people, 150 petabytes. Now, if you don't know Shutterfly, Shutterfly stores photos of your family so that you can make calendars and T-shirts and coffee mugs. And that's where they make the money. They store your photo for free, you buy a coffee mug. They store your photo for free, you buy the T-shirt. That's where they make their business. All right, it's a good business. And the thing is, is they can do it so cheaply. Now, they used to be in California, and they needed to move 80 petabytes from California to Las Vegas, Nevada, into their brand new data center. What did they do? One fourth of their servers, they turned them off, put them on a truck, drove them to Las Vegas, turned them on. Guess what? You only need three of the four, you're good to go, right? Zero disruption of service. Every weekend, they took one fourth of the servers on a truck, and in four weekends, they moved 80 petabytes from California to Las Vegas. Great success story. They didn't even tell IBM about this. IBM says, hey, the call home is saying it's in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah, we moved them all this uh, last month. What? Yeah. You cannot move 80 petabytes any other way. Good luck moving anything of any large quantity like that without disruption, because they're not going to take their business down for a month. There is no good time to do outages, ever. In today's world, there is no holiday weekend or Christmas weekend that you can say, I'm just going to be shut down. It doesn't happen anymore. We have to be running 24-7. Great success story, uh, and they save lots of money. Now, you're thinking, how can I combine this with what IBM already has? We have a lot of people who do this combination. They will store initially in spectrum scale. It's fast. It's flash. It's metadata. It puts the data on disk. And when the data is cold, I have two choices. I can move it to tape, or I can move it to cloud object storage, either on-premise cloud object storage or off-premise in the cloud. So this is a chance for you to store things in the cloud when they're not active anymore. So you might think, well, they're very active now. Now they've settled. Now they're stable. Now they're ready for the cloud. And so this gives people a great opportunity. For example, uh, we have uh, in Washington, D.C., the Kennedy Center. The Kennedy Center has performances that they video record these performances, award ceremonies, ballet, comedians, whatever the different TV shows, and they store it initially in spectrum scale. High speed flash directory infrastructure. Then the whole content is moved to cold storage. And when you want to click on it and play, we stored the first three minutes in spectrum scale and the rest is on cold storage. So when you play the video, it's instantaneously. And in three minutes, they've brought everything else back, and it's ready to play. So you can watch an hour and a half video that you think looks like it's on flash when it's really on cold storage. Right? Great solution, and they're paying cold storage prices, making it look like hot data. All right, so uh, summarizing. The encryption is built in. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to plan for it. It's included, ready to use. The erasure coding is included. It's done in real time, and you get to choose 7 plus 5, 13 plus 7, 4 plus 5, however combination you feel comfortable with. The software is packaged with the operating system. We put the Linux and the code all in one clump. You just install it, ready to use. You can run it as a VM, as a Docker or on bare metal. 
the disk lifecycle management. It automatically looks, is there any failure? Is there anything missing? If it finds that it's missing a piece, it recreates the piece. All features are included. So we didn't have to give you all these choices and options. You just pay per terabyte, flat price for the solution. And we have what we call the perpetual license mode, which means that if you buy the software, on, you're running it on an HP server or a Dell server or a Lenovo server, and five years from now that server fails, time to replace it, you don't have to buy the software again. You just replace the hardware and the software, you continue using it. So that's called a perpetual license. Why should you have to buy the software again? You shouldn't have to, right? The software you buy, you keep it up to date, continues with the new hardware. So that's cloud object storage. Summary, uh, if you want to hear more about it, there are a lot of people are using the uh, cloud object storage to replace EMC Isilon or Data Domain or NetApp, uh, a variety of solutions that are currently file-based. This turns out to be less expensive alternative. Questions? No? Okay. Anybody? Who has more than 500 terabytes? Yes, pharmaceutical, definitely. Lots of data. Uh, you'll be surprised. You will be, most companies will be more than 500 terabytes soon enough. Just a matter of time. Yes, yeah, when not if. All right, Luis, shall I go on to the next topic? Continue on? All right, let's, let's move it to the next topic. Mm -hmm.